So as the lead developer of a company called Invenia Technical Computing, I've been working professionally in MATLAB for about five years or so, which has given me what I think is a fair understanding of its various quirks, a few of which I'm planning to showcase today. I want to make it clear that I love MATLAB. Love, love, love it. There may be a bit of the old Stockholm Syndrome involved now that I think about it. So if you love it too, please don't take this gentle ribbing too harshly. And if you don't love MATLAB, well, I can't say as I blame you. A word of warning before we proceed. If you expect this talk to be anywhere near as quick or as entertaining as Gary Bernhard's lightning talk from CodeMash 2012, uh, you will be sorely disappointed. <laughs> if you haven't seen that talk, I don't know what you're doing here, but you should probably be watching it instead. So keep in mind that depending on your version of MATLAB and even your operating system, your mileage may vary. I'm using MATLAB R2009B for this demonstration. So let's start off with some basic stuff. We'll make ourselves a vector. Okay, so we've got a single row. It has three elements. Now let's look at one of those elements. There you go. Element number one is one. First of all, and most obviously, MATLAB is one indexed rather than zero indexed. While this is weird for most programmers, you tend to get used to it pretty quickly. But I figured that I'd mention it up front to minimize any confusion that might crop up later on. Another weird thing that you'll notice pretty early, or in my case, not until you've used MATLAB every day for three years, uh, is that casting to an integer is a little weird. What do you suppose I'll get if I cast 1.5 to an integer? The answer is 2. Personally, I was expecting a truncation with a result of 1. While rounding isn't unheard of, it can result in some hard-to-spot bugs if you're expecting it to truncate. So I might as well show you that the 32-bit uh, integers behave the same way. There you go. Rounded to 2. So, in MATLAB, uh, you'll occasionally have to deal with empty matrices. Perhaps I'll win an award for understatement of the year. So, to make an empty matrix, you can just do this. Just open bracket, close bracket, and you have your empty matrix. Uh, you may also have to use the sum operator a fair bit. Sum of 0 is, of course, 0. If you do a sum of a whole bunch of numbers, uh, throw an 8 and a 13, why not? There you go, you get 33. So the sum operator will operate uh, either across rows or across columns, and it will uh, sum up all of the numbers. It's got some options, it's great. And uh, you might be wondering, if it might cause problems if you try to do the sum of an empty matrix, because maybe your code is expecting you to always get a number back, and getting an empty matrix back might be a problem. Well, MATLAB has a solution for you. If you do a sum of an empty matrix, you get zero. Perfect. That is exactly what we're looking for. It sort of makes sense, right? So the open bracket, close bracket that you see there represents a zero by zero empty matrix. However, this isn't the only sort of empty matrix that you can have in MATLAB. So let's take a look at a few more. Let's start with a 1 by 0 empty matrix. So we can create that like this. Uh, we'll use the zeros function, which just fills a matrix with zeros. Uh, you can also use 1s or nan. Uh, so we'll do zeros, and we'll make it a 0 by 1 matrix. OK, empty matrix, 0 by 1, exactly what we're looking for. So let's do a sum of that matrix. What do you suppose we'll get? If you said 0, you're right. Perfect. So the sum of a 0 by 1 empty matrix is 0. How about the sum of a 1 by 0 empty matrix? Well, that's pretty easy to do. Got a 1 by 0 matrix, sum also 0. Perfect. So we know that a 0 by 0, a 1 by 0, and a 0 by 1 matrix, when you sum them up, you always get 0. It's exactly what we're looking for. Let's check some other empty matrices, just to be sure. Uh, let's do a equals zeros 2. So we'll do a 2 by 0 empty matrix, okay? Still empty, still has no elements. Let's do the sum of that matrix. An empty matrix. Huh. That's kind of weird. Uh, okay, so the sums of 0 by 0, 1 by 0, and 0 by 1 empty matrices are all 0, but the sum of a 2 by 0 empty matrix is a 1 by 0 empty matrix. Huh. Well, uh, fair enough, I guess. Uh, what would the sum of a 0 by 2 empty matrix be, I suppose? Okay. 
If you said that the sum of a 0 by 2 empty matrix would be a 1 by 2 matrix with two zeros in it, then you'd be right. If you said it would be a 0 by 1 empty matrix, then I applaud you for your hopeless optimism. One of the cool things about MATLAB is the way that it uses for loops. So in MATLAB, every for loop is really just a for each loop. So when you write for i equals 1 to 10, and we'll put an actual equal sign instead of a minus, what it's doing is it's instantiating a vector with the elements between 1 and 10, and then looping through each element in that vector that it instantiated. So these two loops would be equivalent. We could set a equal to 1 to 10, and we can do for i equals a. And there we go. However, if we transpose a so that it's a column instead of a row, something weird happens. Now, notice the spacing here. Compare the spacing right here to this spacing right here. What do you suppose is going on here? Well, it's because the display statement is actually displaying all of the elements at once, rather than separately. Here we're actually only looping through the for loop once, and the only time through the loop i contains the entire contents of a. This is easier to illustrate with a multi-dimensional array. So we'll set a equal to magic 4, and we'll say for i equals a. That makes it pretty easy to see what MATLAB is doing, and it's doing something pretty weird. MATLAB is looping through four times and displaying the contents of one column at a time. So when you do a for loop, make sure that you know that you're not actually looping through every element in the array, you're looping through every column in the array. Weird. Okay, we'll take a short break to talk about functions. So I've got a function here. The name of that function is function name. As you can see, that's the entire contents of the file. So we'll run function name, and as you can see, we give it a number, it will recursively call itself n times, counting down each time. So if I call function name 5, you'd expect to see function name 5, function name 4, function name 3, function name 2, function name 1. However, when I call it, something weird happens. We're seeing file name. That's kind of funny. When you have a public function like this in MATLAB, the actual function name that you provide is irrelevant. It is completely ignored, uh, although you do get a warning if it doesn't match the file name. The actual name of your function is the file name. So as you can see right here, up at the top and down at the bottom, the name of this file is filename.m, which means that the name of the top function in the file is file name, regardless of what you pretend it is. So uh, I have a, uh, a ghost function right here in a file called function name, and I've called the function file name, and it is doing the exact same thing, but these functions are actually bouncing back and forth, calling each other, as you can see right here. You might be wondering what would happen if I edited my function to add another function, file name. We have our file called file name, and it contains a function called function name and a function called file name. You might think when I call the file name function that it would look in the file named filename.m, find the function named file name, and run it. And you'd be wrong. When I call file name, it is just referring to the very first function in the file. Okay, why don't we move on to dates? The first thing you want to know is that discrete dates for example, the 13th of February 2013, are represented in the same way that time periods, say eight hours or one day, are represented. So there's no separate time delta object. There are three main date formats, two that are generally used for storage and manipulation, and one that is primarily used for display purposes. Datevec is a six element vector. So if we say D equals datevec 1st January 2013 at 1800, we get the year, month, day, hour, minute, second. The second format we have is called a date num. So a date num is a floating point date number with a unit resolution of one day, and the epoch is year zero. Yeah. Let's take a look at what one of those might look like. So d equals date num. So let's view that in a slightly easier to read format. Uh, one of the more interesting pieces of information, you can see it's uh, 18 
100 hours, 6 p.m., which is three quarters of the way through the day. It's a 0.75. You can tell our unit is one day. Uh, next, we'll talk about date stir uh, that converts a date num or a date vec into something a little bit more readable. We can say date stir d. There you go. So let's do some arithmetic. So we have our starting date. We'll start it at midnight. That will just uh, give us a nice round number to work with. Just take a look at that. 1st of January 2013. Uh, it truncates the time here because uh, it's midnight, so maybe we just don't care about what the time is. MATLAB makes those sort of assumptions all the time, and it can sometimes be a little frustrating. First, we'll add one minute, and we'll use a vector here to specify exactly what we mean. Uh, so we're adding zero years, zero months, zero days, zero hours, one minute, and zero seconds. There we go. 1st of January 2013 at 12.01 uh, a.m. Exactly what we expect. Now let's add an hour. We have 1 a.m. Now let's add one day to our original date. 2nd of January, and once again it truncates the midnight part because it assumes you don't care about it. Uh, let's skip months. Uh, let's try adding one year. So the 1st of January 2013 plus one year. The 2nd of January 2014. Why add 365 days when you can add 366? I suppose that means adding two years will give us the 3rd of January 2015, right? 2nd of January 2015. So, what's going on here? Well, in MATLAB, when you add one year, you're actually adding one instance of year zero, which is totally a thing, by the way. And year zero was, you guessed it, a leap year. <laughs> so when you add two years, you're adding year zero and year one. That's 366 days plus 365 days, obviously. Okay, so let's forget the years. We'll add a month. Expect adding a month to our initial date should give us the 1st of February, right? The 1st of January 2013 plus one month is the 1st of January 2013. Okay, let's try adding two months, I guess. Maybe that'll do something. Huh. Well, all right then. So adding two months adds one month. Uh, fair enough, I guess. Uh, let's change things up. Let's add two months to the 1st of February. What do you think, what do you think will happen there? I don't know, uh, the 1st of March, because adding two months equals adding one month. What do you think? The 4th of March. Of course not! We end up with the 4th of March. <laughs> so, what's going on here? Well, when you add two months, you're actually adding one month, as we've previously established. But which month? January, of course. And how many days are in January? 31. So when you add 31 days to the 1st of January 2013, you get the 1st of February 2013, and it all works out. But when you add 31 days to the 1st of February 2013, you get the 4th of March 2013. This is because MATLAB doesn't have separate time delta objects, at least uh, not in 2007 or 2009b. So you have to use your date objects and your time delta objects interchangeably. And when you add two months, you're actually adding the beginning of February to whatever date uh, you're talking about. So the beginning of February is 31 days away from the beginning of time. So you're adding 31 days when you add month two. So how about adding three months to the 1st of January, 2013? Uh, what would happen then? I'd imagine that it would add two months, January and February. So we'd end up with the 1st of March, 2013, right? Because as we saw earlier, adding one month to January resulted in the 1st of February. So adding two months to January should result in the 1st of March. Okay. Well, let's try this. So we've got our 1st of January, and we're adding, it looks like three, but it's actually two months because we're adding the beginning of March. What should we get? Come on, 1st of March. And it's the 2nd of March. So what happened? Any guesses? Well, we did add January and February. And how many days are in February? Why, 29, of course. 
Because which February are we adding, after all? Why, February of the year zero, which totally existed, if you'll remember. And I haven't even gone into the floating point rounding problems with date nums, which are legion. So, that's all I'm going to cover for today. I skipped a few things that caused me grief back when I was on R2007B, and a few other intriguing tidbits that are a little harder to reproduce. And special thanks to Brendan Curran-Johnson for helping me with the function name file name example. That was a doozy.